Okay, so welcome to the second but last session here. So today I will talk a little bit about a method to to fit repulsive potentials within DFTB. A thing that we have given the name curvature constrained splines, and I think the name will become rather obvious with time here. So let's go back. You have probably seen this now many times. So the energy expression for DFTB, where we have essentially three main terms, and uh, we we just looked at the parameters that are involved in in the two first of these terms. So essentially, the parameter are actually primarily in that first term, the first term which is coupled to the second term, the so self-consistent uh, term there. So we looked carefully at those, I think, and what what is left, the far right there, is this repulsive energy term that's supposed to correct the energy and make up for many of the terms that we are neglecting in 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 working with this minimum basis valence only uh, approximation so as balint already uh, alluded to in his presentation this repulsive is typically represented by a two body energy expression simple analytical typically expression where you are just considering pairwise energy terms. And this repulsive potential is almost always fitted towards a reference, DFT reference. So a number of structures that you may be interested in. And you're trying to fit the parameters involved here in order to as closely as possible reproduce these energies of your reference set. So that's what we will be looking at here and also try out in the, in the tutorial later on. So just to give you a little idea of um, what's, what's, uh, what one can do here. So this is just an example from our group where we are interested in zinc oxide, uh, which is a very interesting material, comes in many different polymorphs. And what we were interested in here was to see if we could use the DFTB method here to, to describe all of these different polymorphs of zinc oxide. And this example here serves really as a good example of uh, how much that is hidden in the details when it comes to this, uh, this repulsive potential. So in this graph here, at the, at the bottom, we see a simple volume scan of two polymorphs of zinc oxide. So essentially what we did was just to take zinc oxide in the bird site structure, which is the ground state structure, and a sodium chloride structure, and simply stretched the cell for each volume, calculated DFT energy. That's what you see to the far left there. And what we did initially was simply to start off with the parameters that were present in this NORG set. And if you do this simple exercise, what you get is the result that you see to the far right there. So you see that, the, that these two polymorphs actually have a incorrect ordering. So DFD would predict that the ground state for structure or polymer for zinc oxide would be sodium chloride which is not really what you expect to be seeing. Um, so what, what we asked ourselves here it was simply, could we fix this incorrect energy ordering by a simple reparameterization of the repulsive potential? And of course, since I'm showing this example, that's actually possible. And uh, I will just show you maybe in some more detail here. So what we, what we did was to, re, to simply re-parameterize only the repulsive part and did a rather extensive tests of various 
polymers and how they perform. And you can see the result there to the, to the right. So to the left, you have the DFT reference. And to the right, you have the DFTB reparameterized reference. You can see it's not perfect. By no means perfect, but it's in, in a reasonable agreement here with, with the DFT reference. We were very happy with this result here. And so essentially all it took to make that magic happen was to go from the from the blue dashed line there to the solid red line here. One could say the devil is in the details. Well, I guess it depends on perspective here. Of course, they are not completely overlapping these curves. You can see their differences, but essentially two curves of similar quality, you could say, have some kind of repulsive behavior there. So it's really important to get these curves in, in, the, in the right shape here, if you want to have good quality result. Just to sum, summarize the, the sort of key points here. So I think if you looked at the result that came out from Balin's optimization, <laughs> the scripts that were running in the background, you will see that indeed, as a, the tight binding method of DFTB plus here is excellent for electronic structure, even though rather complex systems, I would say. Parameterization can be quite tedious and highly nonlinear. So it's often a large investment for new systems. And that's something we are trying to, to mitigate a little bit with the, the approach that I will be showing you today. So part of this problem is related to the fitting of the repulsive potential. That's one part that can make this whole process tedious for new systems. It can be difficult to do this optimization. There are, of course, alternatives out there. So you have spline-based approach by Gauss. You have also least square fitting based on, on uh, basis functions here. The approach that we took coming from a chemist background was to use the Buckingham potential, a very well-known two-body potential that's normally used to describe ionic solids. Um, they all come with, with uh, drawbacks and, and strength here. So the idea here was to try to uh, draw from the strength here and, and come up with something that actually is somewhat better than these approaches here. So, it, of course, in a broader sense, many methods involve uh, or parameterization tasks involve the fitting of two body in one way or the other. So this is, you could say, extends far beyond the, the use of, of uh, repulsive potential fittings. Just to point that out here. Okay, I will just make a very, very brief background to two body potential. I mean, there is endless endless uh, two-body expressions of potentials in the literature. I think the one few of the most well-known examples are given here. The Leonard Jones, I think it's probably been mentioned also during the week here. Moore's potential Buckingham. So you have ex essentially a big palette of functions that you could use if you would like to do this uh, repulsive fitting. So in a broader sense, one could say, why are people interested in using the two body potentials in the first place? What, what, is, what is it that people like about them? Well, most of these functions are actually rather physically intuitive, often very high performing. And that's of course important. Some of the drawbacks, not all of these methods, Leonard Jones is not one of them perhaps, but especially for multi-component system where you have multiple atoms in your system, the fitting process is actually highly non-linear often. The functional form makes them somewhat inflexible at times as well. And of course, they are only two body. And we will hear more about that later on, how you can actually extend beyond that. So the idea here is to try to take these, um, these pros and 
reduce or remove the cons there. That's the whole essence of our approach here. I guess Nir may come back to this later on, but what we really would like to do here is to make use of linear fitting and linear models have some qualities that make them very appealing. So optimization is simple and also I think one of the main benefit is that you have a single global minima in these cases. So you don't have to search for do a global optimization search. You can you can get the global minima and it's it's that's the key benefit here, I would say. All right. So question one could ask, and I will try to answer is the following can we construct something that's flexible, flexible, physically intuitive, and linear and two body? And the approach we've taken here is to use a cubic spline. And just quick background to what we mean with cubic spline. So cubic spline is nothing but a function that's defined piecewise by uh, polynomials like this. And you're connecting the intervals through these knots here. And you make sure that you have continuity uh, along these, um, along these uh, spline curves. Mathematically, it looks like this. It's nothing but a, as you can see in this case, for cubic splines, uh, third order polynomial, piecewise defined. And for future reference here, I would like to point out that this, you have these different coefficients there. And in front of the second order term there, you have the, something that we can think about as a local curvature of these splines. This will be important in the in the following here. And then there are some constraints to make sure that this is continuous and you have second continuous second derivative and so on. So typically what we would like to achieve when doing any type of fitting of this sort is to have the situation in the middle there. We don't want to do underfitting. We certainly doesn't don't want to do overfitting. And the typical approach that people take here is to use some kind of regularization to make sure you smooth out this, this, uh, this curve, avoid overfitting. So the approach we have taken here is somewhat different. What we are trying to do is to encode this desired result in the, in the construction of the whole thing. I will just briefly go through how we think about it. So if you look at this family of, say, traditional two-body uh, Potentials, they essentially, many of them share this, this, uh, this property that you have a short range repulsive uh, behavior, and then at long range, essentially tends to zero, and they have an attractive region somewhere in, in between there. So, of course, you can think about them as being repulsive and then attractive. In terms of the curvature, you can also think about them as having a region of a positive curvature and a region of negative curvature and instead separated by an inflection point like that. So this is where, so this is the, the quality that we will be using now in, in, in constraining our splines here. That's why I pointed out the, this, uh, the role of this C coefficient in the spline table there. I will get back to, back to it very, very soon here. So the idea is simply to use the spline, constrain it in such a way that the, the coefficient that is actually describing the local curvature of the thing goes from a region with a positive cur curvature to a region of a negative curvature. That, that's the essence of it. And essentially, all it takes is to, well, it takes a, a student with a good sense of math, I guess, which I was lucky to have. And uh, what he did was simply to reformulate the fitting procedure such that you can express this spline entirely in terms of the local curvature. So knowing the local curvature, you, got, you get out a unique spline 
you have to have some boundary conditions there. They are quite natural in this case. You want to have a zero, zero at the end point with a zero, zero derivative there. So by encoding that, you can actually rewrite the spline solely in terms of local curvature. And that's, of course, really excellent if you want to now apply linear fitting to this. You have a set of parameters, C, and you can impose the constraints you want. They are linear constraints, very trivial to make. And you simply solve. And what you need, of course, is some kind of objective function, some reference. And in our case, that would be this repulsive energy. So what we want to do is to obtain the set of C coefficients that minimize the energy EK model. That's the, the energy described by our spline and the reference energy. So a simple objective function like that. And we want to minimize it. And of course, each uh, configuration or each training point in your set will have multiple distances, obviously. So if you have a molecule, it's not just one single distance. So for each configuration, we, we will have a number of distances. And I should probably, let's see, I have to look at the watch and see, yeah, okay, I can give it a few more minutes, I guess, before we go to the hands-on. So I will upload this document, obviously, so you can go back and, and have a look for yourself. But it's, it's also rather straightforward to rewrite this in a simple form uh, when you also consider systems with multiple elements, multiple distances. It's just some bookkeeping that you need to do, but you can, at the end of the day, you can formulate it as a matrix multiplied with these coefficients equals target energy to the left. So you can cost it in, in a linear form very, very conveniently. So it's essentially, the only remaining thing now is to encode the constraint. And that can be done, I guess, in various ways. But what the student came up with was to use the quadratic programming approach, which I think is a really neat way of doing this, to be honest. You don't have to pay too much attention to the details here. I can just walk you through the idea. So in a situation where you have a linear model and you have linear constraints, you can trivially put it in a quadratic programming uh, formulation and just solve it and get, get the desired answer here. So you can see that the constraints are encoded in this second line there, multi matrix multiplication by C and then some condition there. So that could really be have all positive Cs up to certain value and then negative and so on. You can also and essentially code any linear constraints on, on the curvature you like there. Might be useful extensions. Okay, there are some subtleties here, but if, if your objective function is symmetric, the problem is convex and you have actually a global minima you, is guaranteed to be found. So that means that once you solve this thing, you have the optimum set of parameters given the constraint. You have nothing really to tweak. There are no regularization to think about. You just get it out. This machinery, which we will now very soon look at, is uh, packaged uh, on the GitHub. So if you wait maybe until after the weekend, I will have made all the changes, all the errors you will spot. <laughs> not too long, <laughs> fixed properly, and then I will make an up, uh, update of it. Um, but we have a local copy on the machines already here, so you don't have to, to download it just yet. But all the functionalities will be there, and hopefully this recipe or this tutorial that we have now will also be at the DFTB page at some point. Yeah, I think I will just conclude and then, of course, acknowledge people involved. Uh, I should not forget that. So essentially, the idea here with the, the 
curvature constraint spline is to formulate uh, our problem into in terms of a quadratic programming problem meaning that we can find the, the best cubic spline under a certain constraint that we put and with this we can essentially encode uh, the behavior of typical two-body potentials in the literature Leonard Jones Buckingham more there are multiple multiple examples of course one should probably be careful with uh, saying encoding physics here because it's in physically inspired but it's not really physically interpretable I mean spline coefficients themselves doesn't have really some of these potentials actually do put some meaning into their, their coefficients we don't so further reading is there and okay most important I guess uh, acknowledgement so Akshay was the student that did most of the, the hard uh, work with the, the math of course Kirsti Hermansson and Peter Bruquist that are um, the head of our group in, in Uppsala and maybe you recognize a few names of course Balint you should be acknowledged here for sure um, but in this uh, original publication of the CCS method maybe you recognize Christopher Kerler there as a Bremen, Bremen guy and then Eddie Vadbro was uh, our mathematical uh, collaborator here so with that I would like to thank you for your attention and then we go over to tutorial mode I guess so thank you.